argued this Wild Wild West 1846 law twice now in front of two different judges. You even said last time you didn't think it necessarily should be the law, but the state legislature right. failed to act. Two judges have said it isn't actually the law, um, and that there there is the same standard for citizens uh, as police officers, as Becker said today. So, I mean, where is this argument going? Are well, we see, see, this see, there's the interesting thing. Is they both said that is the law. Uh, in fact, Judge Ayub called it draconian. And frankly, most people today would agree. But what they're saying is, is that private citizens today, as they could back then, uh, have the protections of the same law. And that's not right. We don't allow vigilantes to run around and, and chase after uh, a fleeing felon. What do we do if someone commits a felony and they run away? If you're not a police officer, what do you do? You call 911. So the prosecutor's uh, argument has the perverse effect of essentially saying it's okay for vigilantes to shoot people in the back. And so because they don't want that result, they're saying that police officers are held to the same standard as a random guy, a private citizen, who wants to make a citizen's arrest. But and the, that's not the law either. But the judge said today that there should not be two different standards of, of murder for citizens and police officers. Isn't that not what she said? That's what she said, but under the law, because the legislature hasn't done anything on this, what that means, if, it, if the common law still applied to private citizens, like an officer, it means you can shoot someone when they're fleeing. And that's not what the court, the court actually said. Um, they consider whether or not they were fleeing, and that's the question of fact. Is it relevant if he's fleeing while the shot is fired? You know, in the video, he's on top of them, not running at that point. Will that prove to be relevant in the well, Fleeing does not mean running. Uh, fleeing means escaping. And so, and there's two prongs to that, either escaping or using force in response to a lawful arrest. And so, uh, you know, it's tough at a preliminary exam, but I don't know how anybody can look at that video and say he wasn't either trying to escape during the entire time or using force to try to get away. And you can argue whether or not he was trying to hurt Officer Sure, but that's what we're saying is not the question. The question is whether it can't be the only time an officer can use his firearm is when um, he's, he's about to be hurt. Maybe that could be the law, but that's not the common law, certainly not the common law in 1846. But, I guess the, but point, how do you, the point is you've argued the law twice now. As a point of law, is this gonna, are, are you going to appeal it somewhere? I mean, that's not going to be what the trial is about, is it? I have no idea what the jury instructions are going to say. In fact, at the end of my argument, I asked the judge, can you tell us what the law is? Because there are three defenses here, basically. And it's an element of the offense whether it wasn't justified. So the government's going to have to prove at trial, if we go to a trial, beyond a reasonable doubt that uh, the fleeing a felon rule doesn't apply, the uh, use of force in response to force doesn't apply, and whether or not uh, Officer Schur acted reasonably in in self-defense. He's always got a right to self-defense. And the cases that discuss this, uh, they don't limit the officer's use of these defenses. What they're doing is limiting the use of the private citizen. Because when we've addressed this in the past, when people have been charged with murder, uh, it's usually, a, it, it's because they used too much force and they should have called a cop. All those cases that the court referred to, except for one, Fiedler, all those are private citizens. This, 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 this idea that officers and private citizens should be treated alike, that comes from a 1930s case where what was had is prohibition, right? And so in, in this case called Gatzler, this guy's making moonshine in his garage, and it was illegal back then, okay? And someone tries to steal his moonshine. And then he claimed that the guy ran away, and because he was stealing his moonshine, he shot him and killed him. He got charged with murder. And so when it goes up to the Court of Appeals, the issue is, well, does the fleeing a felon rule apply in that situation? You have a guy who's doing something illegal, and a guy runs away, and they still held it up. It applies, but you have to have a reasonable belief that the person that is running is actually the person, an actual belief. So, and they have actually committed a felony. The guy got convicted. All those cases relate to vigilante justice. And if we're going to start treating the police officers as vigilantes, why would anybody want to be a police officer? This arrest was textbook, was absolutely textbook. 
It started with a lawful stop where the plates didn't match the car. There were lawful commands. The officer was respectful and polite and firm, which he's supposed to be. Every step of the way, Captain McCursey testified that he followed his policy and training every step of the way. And so whether or not that's reasonable under the circumstances, if that's going to be left to the jury, I hope that we get to at least put evidence on that every officer that's looked at this and reviewed it, nearly every prosecutor that's reviewed it, does not think that's murder under the law. And so that issue is going to have to be decided. I, how, how do you justify, though, the, the shot in the back of the head? I'll, I mean, I'm trying to, with a jury, I mean, how do you get that? It's where the deadly force is used is absolutely irrelevant under the law. The question is, when can you use deadly force? Not where. So, because it's, the reason that's, that's the rule is because you can kill somebody if you shoot them in the back of the leg, right? Just like you could shoot someone in the back of the head and they not die. So where you use the deadly force is irrelevant. All the cases discuss when. When can an officer use deadly force? So where is irrelevant? So moving forward, and I know you've indicated that you will appeal, but looking ahead as we stand now to a trial, um, in terms of the jury, there's going to be very few people to find who haven't heard of this case, very few people who may not be pressured by societal concerns. Are you fearful when it comes to the jury selection? I'm always fearful picking a jury because I never know what they're going to do. Uh, but, we, you know, we'll try to get uh, a fair and impartial jury. And I think the people of Kent County uh, can do that if we're going through the jury process and no one can say they're going to be fair and impartial. Uh, then we'll, you know, we, we could consider moving it to another county. But uh, right now, you know, there's on both sides. I, I, could, I could see uh, people feeling very strongly one way or the other. And they're going to be asked, can you set that aside, those opinions, and look at all the evidence uh, and apply it to the law? I mean, the question that we're arguing about today is, is uh, not necessarily the facts. We're really arguing about the law because it's still not clear. And Officer Sure only wants the opportunity to go to trial uh, and have his day in court with the correct law. Uh, obviously, he does not feel like he committed a crime. Um, but right now, the crime is still undefined. So you plan to appeal today's ruling? Is that what? Yes, we plan to seek leave to appeal. So state, it, state court it's appeals. not an automatic state appeal. Appeals, that's, it would that's be up that's to that's the that. Court of Appeals, yeah. So you expect, I mean, the trial is scheduled for March, right? I mean, if you take it to the Court of Appeals, is that even going to happen? Do you expect it to start in March? Well, the court could stay the action. I don't know if you, uh, the court will or, or will not. Um, no, I, if, it, if it were brought to an appeal, I would expect that the proceedings would be stayed and it wouldn't go on March 13th. It, it seems, <clears throat> excuse me, it seems like the judges have agreed with you with the question is like, when is deadly force um, authorized? But it seems like they both interpreted that it's a question for a jury. Um, not that you have to get into like trial strategy or anything, but how do you plan on approaching the jury in kind of saying that Officer Sure was, was justified in his use of deadly force? I, you know, I think it's a good question. I mean, certainly I think everybody knows our defense at this point. And you have a, a suspect who flees, who doesn't get very far, and, and, and will not respond to any lawful command. And so our defense is that Officer Shab Sure was doing his job he was trying to arrest him uh, for a host of different felonies. Uh, Patrick Lillo was fleeing uh, because he did not want to be arrested. And so the law affords uh, police officers the right to arrest somebody under those circumstances. And the law affords him the right to use deadly force under certain circumstances. We're still arguing about that. Uh, but the facts are relatively undisputed. Patrick Leola fought with Officer Schur for several minutes didn't listen to a single command, disarmed him of his taser. In our point of view, had the taser in his exclusive control, which is a finding that the district court already made. And he transferred it from his left hand to his right hand. And then the moment before the shot, he was rising off the ground. And so our defense is, uh, first of all, there's the common law fleeing felon rule and the use of force in response to force, but also that he acted uh, as any officer or and I think we only have to show a officer would have under the circumstances. Would any officer be justified in using deadly force under those circumstances? And the prosecutor, prosecutor has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that no officer was justified. 
And so I think the prosecutor's got a tough burden in this case. So was Patrick Leoya, I'm sorry, fighting with him or fighting to get away? Is, is there a distinction there? He's fighting with him to get away. <laughs> uh, obviously, the officer's trying to arrest him, and he doesn't want to be arrested. I mean, you've seen the video. Looks like he's trying to get away, right? Uh, well, you, you, you can't do that. It's a lawful arrest. And he's asking him to stop. Uh, and then he's telling him to drop the taser. Uh, the, the law isn't that he's, uh, with regard to the fleeing felon rule, that he's about to hit him with the taser. That's why Judge Ayub called it draconian. Because a lot of people, and I'm not saying this is the right law or the wrong law, believe that the only time an officer should use deadly force is when it's reasonable under the circumstances to use deadly force. But we're still in 1846. So, I mean, I, you guys can watch the video as well as I. I mean, it appears to me that he's doing everything he can to get away, including yelling to his passenger, get the keys, get the keys, meaning we're getting out of here, or maybe move the evidence of the crime away from here, one of the two. But uh, that's not, it's not permitted under the law that you can fight with a police officer. In any way, do you think it'll help or hurt your case that someone was standing by recording the altercation? I, I, you know, it, it is what it is. Um, and I personally, I'm glad that there are more recording devices these days because these things come to light uh, more often. And, you know, uh, good or bad. And I think society in general is benefited by the fact that uh, things are recorded. And so, uh, I mean, there are witnesses too, but. Here you have video evidence. The video evidence actually doesn't capture the entire thing. It goes up and down, and uh, Officer Schur's uh, body cam goes off, off and on. Uh, but uh, I think we're helped by the video evidence uh, because while you can take a snapshot of a picture and make it look bad, the instant the shot was fired, uh, that doesn't erase the uh, minutes beforehand when Patrick Gillo was violently resisting arrest. Given that you you're using 18, a pre-Civil War era law in this fleeing felon law. Can you talk about the difficulties that that imposes upon bringing forward this case in 2023 when we've had so much social justice movements even here in Grand Rapids and explain how that, does that make your job harder, the way that, that how low this law is? Yes, I, yeah, and I'm, shame on the legislature for doing nothing. When the Michigan Supreme Court in 1990 specifically called on the legislature, it's in the opinion, we're not going to decide this. We're not going to decide what, what's justification in these circumstances. You guys do it because we don't want to pass on this as a, as, as a crime because that's not our job. The legislature makes the laws. So perhaps the legislature now that we have this situation where nobody seems to know what Officer Schur is uh, held accountable for or if this old law applies, uh, whether we want it to apply, maybe they'll do something now. Are you confident that you'll prevail at trial? Yes. Thanks, No, I don't. I don't want you don't that. want that? What do you need? Hold back. What's that? Who's got any questions? I have one. You walked in with an absolute air of confidence. So it was the first thing, not cockiness. First thing I noticed, very few things in your hand comparative to the defense. Um, what makes you so confident today? I, I don't think it was confident. I thought, you, like, the motion when we had the, the bind over, I think we were, the law was on our side. I mean, I think, you know, we prepared a good brief, uh, and I just didn't think there was an issue that I was getting even close. I mean, I think I, the judge summed it up pretty well in her decision that, you know, the law's on our side in terms of this should be, at this stage, is of a jury question. I mean, that's what it's basically about. It's not whether, you know, the, the final determination. It's whether the jury should hear the case, and we clearly believe that, and the, the judge upheld that today. So I think that's, that would be the confidence, how, I guess. How confident are you that a jury will 
decide that he was not justified. That's, uh, that's going to be up to a jury. I'm not going to make any predictions on that. That's up to a jury ultimately, um, and we'll see. What do you make of the judge's thoughts on um, police department policy and whether that could be evidence? Yeah, I, I think she was saying she she is kind of an interesting, you know, splitting of the hairs, if you will. She's saying I, I don't think the judge should have, you know, dealt with it at the preliminary hearing, but she was quite clear that she's not making any preliminary determinations, saying it can't come in at the trial. So I, I think that was just kind of, you know, maybe a little inside baseball in terms of I, she's not making saying it can't come in at the trial. So that may be something we hash out down the road, but you know, at this point in time, I don't think that was that big of an issue. Well, but in terms of your trial strategy, are you going to try to get that excluded as evidence based on what she said today? I'm not going to divulge what my trial strategy is. So, <laughs> do you feel do like you, the law is clear here? I mean, we just spoke with the defense. He feels like there's some. I, I, like I said, I said that in my you know my brief thing. I, you know, we're, we speak the same language, but we uh, we're not understanding each other because I think it's you know perfectly clear. I mean, it's not a close call. So yeah, I think there's a difference at least in our interpretation. Our interpretation is this is very clear that, you know, you police officers are treated the same. Chris, is the plea and felon so argument circular? Because Mr. Sure, I mean, Mr. Leoila was just a traffic stop. And then the officer escalated everything to felonies. It wasn't like he's a bank robber right down well, the street. No, they keep yeah, saying he's yeah. a felon running. He wasn't. He was a traffic stop. Well, it was a resisting opposing. Resisting opposing, he ran. He clearly ran. And we conceded that at the preliminary exam. So it's hard for us to say it's not a fleeing. You know, he was fleeing. Um, it was resisting. So those and, are issues that. And know, that's a felony. Because, yeah, resisting an officer is a felony. This okay. is an 1846 law, pre Civil War era law. No, no, no. He's, he was talking about the. Well, the the common law, the fleeing felon, but there is that—that's a law. But it's—it's it's been developed over time, and that's our position. You know, it's not like the, we're stuck in 1846. There's been case law and Supreme Court cases that the judge cited and that we cited that have developed that law over time. So Jesse James is not relevant here. I don't think so. Okay. That's my point because he, he sure. portrayed him as a bank robber, you know, a fleeing felon. Sure. This was a traffic stop. Yeah, but it's, a, it's still a felony. And, you know, we we conceded that, so it's hard for me to say no, it's not. I mean, we said that at the, the preliminary exam. So he's still trying to argue that he, he thinks uh, citizens and police officers should not be held to the same standard because then that sort of elevates citizens to be vigilantes on the streets. Do you see any like possible bad side effects here by arguing that citizens and police officers should be held to the same legal standard for use of force? Well, that, that's the you know that's the thing in terms of I think my concern is that you know if police are held to a different standard, yeah, you know, you pull a police officer says, hey, come with me, and you pull away, all of a sudden the police officer can kill you. That, that's you know stunning in its application. So I, I think that's the biggest thing. I, you know, civilians have always, you know, reasonable force and only when immediately necessary. I think that's clearly for civilians and it's clearly for police too. That was our point. Defense has indicated that they're going to seek uh, leave to appeal uh, sure. Judge Elmore's decision. Do you have any concerns about the trial getting pushed back, possibly, or is that just that, part of the problem? No, it could be. I mean, quite, quite, quite frankly, it could be. Uh, that's something we're going to have to see how it hashes out. Um, you know, March is coming up quickly, and so. I'm not going to predict at any point in time what's going to happen, but that is a possibility. Is the county at all in communication with the Leoya um, family? I know that they've been frustrated that the trial has taken so long. Any, sure, any, we're, we're, any communication with them? We've been in communication. That's you know they're our victim witness unit, and we're in communication with them at all times. We let them know if this was going to happen today. They said they weren't going to show up, uh, but we're always in contact with them, and uh, we'll notify them what's going on, and I'll try and keep them abreast as best we can. So no surprise today. Not for me. I mean, I think this is kind of how I expected it to go because, I, I thought, like I said, I thought the law was fairly clear and on our side. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris.